Memento, written by Christopher and Jonathan Nolan, directed by Christopher Nolan and released in 2000, concerns a film noir story about Leonard Shelby, played by Guy Pearce, who suffers severe short-term memory loss, but is attempting to find and kill his wife's rapist murderer. Nolan plays with the sequential ordering of the film, showing two storylines, one in colour moving backwards and one in black and white moving forwards. Memento followed the so-called cult hit, 1999's Fight Club, directed by David Fincher and written by Jim Ools. Like Memento, the viewer of Fight Club witnesses the story through one pair of eyes only, that of its unnamed narrator, Edward Norton. However, unlike Memento, while the narrator and Brad Pitt's Tyler Durden plan their social revolution through Project Mayhem, Fincher keeps the pathology of the narrator a secret to both the narrator and the audience. Critics have considered both films to be a mind game or puzzle film, but what is a mind game film? Warren Buckland calls the puzzle film a post-classical mode of filmic representation, in which non-classical characters perform non-classical actions and events. These stories are complex, largely because of the way that they present their content. Unlike the classical Hollywood genre, mind game films miss out key pieces of information or lie to the viewer. Thomas Elsa Esser stresses the point that mind game films suspend the common contract that films do not lie, but are truthful and self-consistent within the premises of their diegetic worlds. The Usual Suspects is a famous example of this, and Hitchcock began the tradition with stage fright. Although non-linear storytelling is a staple of filmmaking, for instance in Double Indemnity, mind game films like Memento use time to puzzle the viewer, not signposting when particular scenes happen and contradicting themselves. This is because of the reliance that mind game films have on subjective memory. André Bazin felt that film had a precedence over memory because of its subjectivity versus the subjectivity and confused nature of memory. But mind game films challenge the idea that the viewer can trust film. Instead, the viewer must question everything, just as the protagonist learns to. So how do mind game films query reality? They use non-linearity, gaps in information, unclaimed POV shots, ambiguity, labyrinthine structure, non-reliable narrators, sometimes with pathological disorders and sometimes dead before the story begins, multi-stranded narratives and multiple diegesis. Because mind game films like Memento and Fight Club are told through the eyes of one narrator, the viewer has no choice but to depend on the protagonist's narrative. This then highlights the role of the viewers, the mental abilities they have to employ, and the mental operations they have to perform. Viewers have to question what they see, and this requires a more active viewer than a classical narrative. Cornelia Klecker is convinced that there is a market for greater complexity, and not every viewer requires or even wants hand-holding, against Wheeler Winston Dixon's statement that contemporary audiences don't want complexity. They want hand-holding simplicity. The enjoying popularity of Memento and Fight Club and the cult status they attain proves Klecker right. The proliferation of YouTube videos and fan forums dedicated to Memento, which I will show later, show the extent to which audiences want to analyse mind game films. Fight Club was released in the year that changed movies, 1999, as diagnosed by Jeff Gordinia. Memento's release a year later is not a coincidence. Cinema has always been capable of acting as a time machine, transporting audiences backwards or forwards in time, sometimes in the same film, as mentioned earlier. However, Christopher Nolan's narrative develops film's ability to manipulate time by showing two storylines that are moving in opposite temporal directions and which will finally meet. This structure is a perfect example of the mind game film's labyrinthine, non-linear structure. Memento also fulfills the criteria of an unreliable narrator. Leonard Shelby is unreliable because he has no short-term memory, so he misrepresents and omits part of the story, because he simply does not know the answers. However, Nolan did not want another verbal, lying to the audience. It's not so much that he's lying, more that he's morally suspect. As Hunter Corday writes, characters normally know who they are in films. Audiences rely on the self-knowledge of characters to guide them across the story arc. But here, Lenny is unsure, due to his condition, of who he is and what is occurring each moment in the story. However, Nolan cleverly suggests that the audience would also be unreliable, even if they have a working memory, because... What makes the film interesting is that it is an exaggeration, an extrapolation of all of our lives. It's not a freak show. Importantly, Nolan pushes the boundary of the unreliable narrator in mind game films by reflecting Leonard's unreliability in the film's structure through the backwards-moving storyline. The audience is really forced to make a lot of decisions and to question everything they're seeing, providing exposition at the end actually makes it clear and more complex and interesting way. The audience is being given potential answers to questions, but really isn't in any way able to judge the truth about any of it. Yet, viewers used to classical narrative expect closure at the end of a film, especially because Memento consciously evokes film noir, which may be puzzling, but also provides the answers. The questions that Memento raises concerning the nature of memory demand answers. The puzzle demands a solution. 
and viewers have been theorising since 2000. Thomas Elsa Esser considers a pathological protagonist to be a characteristic of the mind game film, with the protagonist often suffering from paranoia, schizophrenia or amnesia. This condition often leads them to seem deluded or mistaken about reality versus their imagination. And, as we have established, the mind game film perceives events through the protagonist's eyes, so the audience are similarly deluded about the reality of the film. Leonard actually has anterograde memory loss. I have this condition. A condition? It's my memory. Amnesia? No, 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 no. It's different from that. I have no short-term memory. I know who I am. I know all about myself. I just... Since my injury, I can't make new memories. Everything fades. If we talk for too long, I'll forget how we started. And next time I see you, I'm not going to remember this conversation. <laughs> I don't even know if I've met you before. So if I seem a little strange or rude or something, uh, I've told you this before, haven't I? Leonard is a man who is trapped in an endless present. Esther Sternberg states that Memento is a close to perfect exploration of the neurobiology of memory. And Nolan wanted to focus on the weakness of memory, rather than showing a completely accurate portrayal of someone with anterograde memory loss. Memory does not always organise itself into narrative, and Leonard uses key facts instead of a narrative to remember his past, leading to ambiguities about the motivations of characters like Natalie, Teddy, and even whether he has already killed his wife's rapist. Ultimately, Leonard's aim in life is to seek revenge, regardless of his condition. Have I told you what this man did? Yeah. Well, then you shouldn't have to ask. But even if you get revenge, you're not going to remember it. You're not even going to know that it happened. My wife deserves vengeance. Doesn't make any difference whether I know about it. Just because there are things I don't remember doesn't make my actions meaningless. The world doesn't just disappear when you close your eyes, does it? And the decisive character that we see at the beginning of the film attests to this. I finally found him. How long have I been looking? Find anything? Didn't think so. Let's go, huh? Oh, fuck this. As Eric Malin explains, Lenny experiences uncertainties of thought and recollection at a time when self-confrontation or doubt could be fatal. He is unsure about the proper course of action, but his uncertainty fails to prevent him from performing acts of awful, unlamented violence. Perhaps the main reason for Lenny's revenge drive is that he cannot achieve closure about his wife's death. How am I supposed to heal if I can't feel time? Through Teddy, Nolan offers the audience an explanation of the many John G's and the impossibility for Lenny of remembering his revenge. What the fuck are you talking about? I don't know. Your wife surviving the assault, her not believing your condition, the torment and, and pain and anguish tearing her up inside, the insulin. That's Sammy, not me. I told you about Sammy. Yeah, right. Like you tell yourself over and over again, conditioning yourself to remember, learning through repetition. But Lenny's pathology allows him to manipulate himself, and he forgets Teddy's truth. I'm not a killer. I'm just someone who wanted to make things right. Can I just let myself forget what you've told me? forget what you've made me do. <sighs> you think I just want another puzzle to solve? Another John G to look for? You're a John G. So you can be my John G. So... Lenny has no short-term memory. He uses notes and tattoos to remind himself of key information, and his life is driven by vengeance. He can also manipulate his memory and trick himself by not writing down certain things, pretending they never happened. Nolan set out to make the audience experience life as Lenny. And my solution to telling the story subjectively was to deny the audience the same information that the protagonist is denied. And my approach to doing that was to effectively tell the story backwards. That way, when we meet a character, we don't know, just like 
the protagonist, how he's met that person, whether he's even met that person before, or whether or not they should be trusted, that kind of thing. This is not a new device. Monica Fludenick discusses the ability of first-person literature to make the reader participate in the fictional process and empathise with the projection of an intrafictional viewpoint. The reader then fills in the blanks in a process of interpretation. This is exactly what happens in Memento. Unlike other people, Lenny relies solely on the key pieces of information he writes down. However, Nolan became aware that everyone's memory requires reminders. Lenny teases Natalie, asking, you never write a phone number on your hand? Ultimately, the film is, is really just an extrapolation of the way I live my life. You know, I write notes on my hands, I take pictures of things, I have objects around, you know, in my apartment to remind me of things, you know, this, this sort of thing. So the script really is just an exaggeration of this. All our memories can be manipulated, like Lenny's is. Lenny himself is aware of the fallibility of memory. Lenny, you can't trust a man's life to your little notes and pictures. Why not? Because your notes could be unreliable. Memory's unreliable. Ah, oh, please. No, 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 really. Ask. Memory's not perfect. It's not even that good. Ask the police. Eyewitness testimony is unreliable. The cops don't catch a killer by sitting around remembering stuff. Right. They, they collect know. facts. That's not what I'm they saying. They make notes and they draw conclusions. Facts, not memories. That's how you investigate. I know. It's what I used to do. Look, memory can change the shape of a room, it can change the color of a car. And memories can be distorted. They're just an interpretation, they're not a record. In this way, Lennon's pathology and the way he responds to it, nothing will stop him avenging his wife, suggests the universality of desire and longing, and the false memory and self-deception they often engender. Caroline Bainbridge suggests that this is the result of a postmodern climate, in which identity is ever more elusive, and the fixities of psychic stability are rendered ever more impossible making Leonard the true everyman, and his pathology simply an exaggerated version of a condition with which we all live. Nolan is clear that he wants the audience not only to empathise with Lenny, but to feel what he feels. So how do Nolan as the writer, Wally Pfister, Dodie Dawn and other creatives on the film achieve this effect? In a film like Fight Club, the schizophrenia of the narrator is hinted at visually in the first scene of the film. The structure of Memento is integral. By moving backwards, the film itself has no memory of the past of the story that it recounts. So, the audience, like Leonard, cannot make reference to a past of events because they are inaccessible to us, or project towards a future of events because they have been left behind. Although, they can remember what has gone before in the film's order and eventually shape it into a transcendent view of the whole, a memory of the future. As Nolan explains in this clip, he uses fragments from two different timelines. This fragmentary quality is important. Not only does the film run backwards, but it straddles two contexts, further disorienting the viewer, so they experience the film like Leonard experiences his life, fumbling for some context. Not only is this disorienting, but it actively makes you forget, just like Leonard has. While we have to keep in mind the actions of the colour sequence, a black and white scene wipes out our working memory and attracts our focus of attention. As a subsequent colour sequence appears, it is difficult to remember the previous one. Towards the end of the film, the black and white storyline meets up with the colour, and so fades into colour. This heralds a sort of explanation, which does come from Teddy, even if Leonard then chooses to forget the explanations. Some viewers have chosen to forget too, as we shall see later. As well as the structure, Nolan's screenplay suggests a mystery from the outset, by opening with a murder. This leads the viewer to concentrate on tiny details, room numbers, licence plates, models of cars, guns, beer mats, scraps of paper just as Leonard must. An example of seeing through Leonard's eyes is when he sees his tattoos. His reaction is one of a man seeing them for the first time, just as the viewer is, even though Lenny has seemingly had the tattoos for some time. The viewer must also attempt to understand Natalie and Teddy's motives, thwarted by the dramatic character changes that occur as the film progresses. Nolan does let some clips slip through his net, suggesting that Leonard may know more than he claims he does. Two subliminal flashes occur long before Teddy's revelation that Leonard is Sammy, in that he killed his wife because conditioning didn't work. A bizarre scene in which a photo of Natalie and Jimmy changes also suggests that Leonard is perhaps manipulating his memory. David Fincher and Jim Alls also use subliminal flashing to suggest the narrator's pathology and ensure the audience experience what the protagonist does. Like Fincher and Alls, Nolan wants the viewer to question the narrative in a way that Leonard does not, not even after Teddy's revelation demonstrating the blind existence that Leonard leads. Human beings want order. They want cause and effect. Leonard cannot rely on cause and effect because he cannot remember the cause. Although the audience of Memento can, to an extent, hold the whole narrative in their head at one time, there are gaps in that narrative. What does Natalie really want? Is Teddy telling the truth? 
How many times has Leonard manipulated himself? We will later explore how people try to fill those gaps, but their existence means that the viewer is as lost as Lenny by the end of the film, without a path of vengeance to keep them focused on a fabricated truth. More than in most films, in Memento, the story is a construction made by the reader from the implications of the narrative discourse, which is all he ever knows. Because Leonard's condition prevents him from being able to give context to his experiences, Memento asks epistemological questions. Elsa Esser states that the mind game film asks, how do we know what we know? Because they question consciousness, memory and perception. Questioning that goes back to Descartes in the 17th century. Because Nolan needs viewers of Memento to question their own memory and perception, they, like Leonard, will ask... Now, where was I? This question places Memento within postmodern cinema, which confronts an epistemological crisis. Firm claims about truth, knowledge, consequences, causes and effects can no longer be made. Nolan's decision to run Memento backwards is not only a symptom of Leonard's memory loss, but also of the complex narrative. Jan Simons suggests that all stories begin at the end, because the narration of a story can only happen after the event has taken place. It is also a symptom of a society with a proliferation of recording technologies, which creates a popular culture of reviewing, rewinding, forward searching, backward searching. The audience of Memento expects a non-linear storyline because of the times they live in and the technology they are surrounded by, and it is reinforced by Leonard's pathology. I feel... As an audience member, very often that, that we're not given enough credit for wanting to look a little deeper into things and think a bit more carefully about, about things. I have already discussed how Nolan attempts to give his viewer short-term memory loss, but how does he relate to the late 20th century feeling of time and consciousness? There are questions about Lenny's own experience. Does he lose his memory when a certain time elapses or when he loses concentration? And viewers have identified many more questions. These questions make Lenny's condition less concrete, and therefore more relatable. Everyone has experienced losing their train of thought. The fragmentation of the narrative communicates the postmodern experience of living in Frederick Jameson's perpetual present. Nolan has stated unequivocally that Memento couldn't be told chronologically for a very simple reason, which is that if you reorder the elements of the story chronologically, um, Logically, it holds together. I felt that was important, that logically it would hold together. But it tells a completely different story. It, it's, and it's pretty much unwatchable. It's just this guy being abused by people around him and all the rest. You can watch a Ford's version of the film with the DVD Easter egg. And indeed, some fans hoped for this when they first saw the film. However, Nolan insists that the reason it doesn't work is because in his version of the film, while the fragments run backwards, it has a forward emotional flow, as Lenny learns, and then forgets, his true narrative. And many viewers agree. Nolan wrote the script in the backwards form, the way it appears on screen. And his conviction that it does not work forwards shows the structure is more than a... Gimmick. It is the only way to convey the story. Nolan is well aware that Memento is a film that produces varied responses in its viewers. But this appears to be something he relishes. If you believe what you've seen in the film, you come to one conclusion. If you believe what you've heard, you come to another. What I'm finding is that most people are very reluctant to abandon the idea of their visual memory. People believe their eyes more than their ears. I find the timing of this casting to be very intriguing. Keep in mind that Memento was only a year after The Matrix, where Carrie Ann Moss played the trustworthy heroine and Joe Pantoliano played the double-crossing villain. I think that may have deceived audiences when Memento first came out. And people certainly interpret the film in varied ways. There are a lot of different reactions to the film. It, it strikes people in very different ways. But a lot of people feel very absorbed into the mindset of the character, which is certainly the idea. Um, and some people find that confusing and frustrating. Other people find that kind of exciting to, to be taken through that. Um, and some people find it depressing. Michael Gatzeniger has discussed the way our brain processes information. The left brain interpreter is what everyone uses to seek explanations for events, triage the barrage of incoming information and construct a narrative that help to make sense of the world. The left brain interpreter can make up stories and beliefs. Memento activates that left brain interpreter. Not that everyone cares what Nolan thinks, especially when he misleads and confuses.
Not only does the 113 minutes of the film raise questions and produce bewilderment, but Christopher and Jonathan Nolan create a world for Memento through transmedia creations. Lev Manovich urges a stop to the division of disciplines like games, film and television because they have common features. Although Manovich is largely talking about digital software, the way that we tell stories in games, film, TV and websites is becoming more and more similar. Elsa Esser discusses how the mind game film arose from the challenges to narrative that digital technologies like websites and games posed. Layering, multiple options, open-endedness. The fact that viewers want to view Memento more than once suggests that it counters digital challenges. There are multiple options in its fragmented and puzzling story. Christopher Nolan wrote Memento based on an idea for a short story that Jonathan Nolan had. Although there are aspects of the film that are not in the story, like the backwards running narrative, or could not work in a written form, like the subliminal flashes which suggest Leonard is wrong about his past, the two stories work side by side, with the story acting as a possible prequel for the film. Christopher also asked Jonathan to design a website to accompany the film. Christopher wanted the website to provide a three-dimensional narrative, where people can view the information in whatever order seems most interesting and follow threads of thought. They can explore Leonard's story beyond the confines of Nolan's film. The website was part of a publicity programme that also included emails that fans could receive from Leonard, aligning the film with Fight Club. Fincher was disappointed with the two-dimensional marketing for Fight Club, wishing for something more akin to what Memento would produce. Brad Pitt and Edward Norton recorded two seditious public service announcements in character, and Fincher titlerized the FBI warning on the DVD to set the stage for the idea of disseminating misinformation. Mind Game Films are fully aware of the multiple platforms that digital technology has produced, and they need to dominate every platform, including advertising and the internet. Not only is there a web of cohesive chains within and across scenes to tie the narrative together, but within and across mediums. The Nolans do not present Memento Mori as canon with Memento, but as an option for the story, just as games have alternate journeys. This recalls a database narrative in which a narrative is just one type of possible interface to collections of data, a particular cause and effect driven sequence of actions and events appears as just one arbitrarily chosen trajectory through a database. All data are simultaneously present. Databases do not have a beginning or an end or development. Nolan presents Leonard's story as a cycle shown in the last, actually first, scene. The story we see in Memento is one arbitrary story in a series during Leonard's life. And with Leonard as an everyman, he is one arbitrary character trapped in his postmodern condition. Leonard in Memento Mori, Leonard on the website, Leonard the viewer, are all alternate options. This produces conflicting interpretations of the film. Using the original story, the website and the film to get an accurate version of the story. I don't think Leonard did kill his wife, though the website makes you think he did. None of Nolan's work to make Memento a teasing, puzzling, transmedia and relatable experience is successful unless audiences and critics perceive and experience the film in the way Nolan wanted. The conditions of making a successful film are higher than ever before for films like Memento. Not only must they work on a global platform, but now also on multiple mediums, such as the DVD release. Although Fight Club bombed at the box office, it performed well on DVD, and its cultural value is clear in the fashion it influenced and the real Fight Clubs it unknowingly produced. Memento similarly experienced a disappointing reception, with many distributors passing on the film. However, when it did secure distribution, it eventually reached milestones never expected for such a low-budget independent movie, with the DVD released before it had even closed in cinemas. This may partly be because so many people went to see the film repeatedly, trying to solve the puzzle. Unlike the livid reviews of Fight Club, critical opinions of Memento analyse the film's structure and devices, often in an objective way. However, many critics cannot help but express their personal feelings about the film, perhaps attesting to its ability to affect its viewer. Some are determined to figure out the film with logic and diagrams. Others imitate the film's structure. James Mottram began his study of the film The Making of Memento with the critical response and ended it with the origin of the film. Alexander Walker was clear about his frustration of the film, I couldn't face the exam it would set me to watch the film again. The feat of keeping so many bits of disparate and seemingly disordered information in one's mind was too much for me. But most critics enjoy this puzzle, viewing Nolan as an incredibly intelligent filmmaker 
who was stirred up questions and feelings about the most basic issues of how we experience reality. The film is a philosophical tragedy. They also seem to largely consider Nolan's attempts to put the viewer in Leonard's shoes a success. Memento not only portrays Leonard's plight, but also, through its reverse chronological structure, attempts to give us a feel for it, prompting us to consider both how we process narrative and how such processing defines our humanity. Lenny and the audience then become collective or conspiratorial detectives, searching for clarity, motivations and meaning. Just like memory, events in the film were experienced over and over in tiny fleeting bits. Each glimpse reveals a little more detail than the previous shot, so that eventually a whole picture emerges. Even after a very large number of viewings, remembering what is going to be shown next is extraordinarily difficult. Lenin's compulsive repetition of events elicits similar behaviour in the spectator. Instills in viewers a need to develop such a narrative, much like Leonard feels a pressing need to use narrative to understand his situation. We tell ourselves stories to make our lives livable, just like Leonard does. No memory, no time. In this digital age, the viewer, the everyman if you will, can be as influential as the critic and the printed press. IMDb and other fan forums are easily available, and they are full of fans and cynics of Memento. Many posters seem to suggest that Memento's experiment is a success. It urges the viewer to spend time working out the film. Not since Fight Club have I wanted to pick apart the complexities of a film. If you do pay attention to the movie, it's very comprehensible. Nolan can make a trippy movie, but also make a straightforward movie at the same time. Only filmmaker I can think of who can do this. You discover something new every time. This, I feel, has become a kind of test by which moviegoers prove to themselves they are clever enough. Some viewers understood the questions about memory and experience that the film wanted to ask. I find the film is more a metaphor for our lives, as much as Leonard's. That is, we seem to be trapped in our own realities and fantasies about life. How much do we trust our own memory, and how much are we willing to change reality to fit our ideas of how things should be? In the real world, we always remind ourselves of things by writing them down, taking pictures, by speaking. Who we are is a lie, who we think we know, who we believe we can trust, what we think we know, what we think we are, it's all drawn into question. Everything in life is grey. The viewer successfully perceives the world as Leonard. body as if it's important I should write it on my body with things to do and what I have no idea what happened in this movie and I think that was the intention I'm trying to think about it now but I now feel that I could have altered my own memories of what I saw in the movie theatre to fit the idea I already had I was completely confused by the end kind of like being in Leonard's shoes I was completely absorbed into his way of thinking it just put the audience in his shoes because we see a scene's conclusion without its beginning, or reason for being, we live this movie the way Leonard lives life. We forget parts of what we've seen, just like the hero forgets what he's been doing. The movie was put backwards to get the feeling of how Leonard has to live his life and figure things out. It's genius. We are instantly put in the shoes of Leonard because we are putting back the pieces of a story, much like Leonard and his photos and notes. In every scene you feel like you're Leonard, and just like him you have no idea what's happening now. It got me saying Leonard's line, now where am I? I like having a bunch of questions I want answered after I watch a movie, but this one left you questioning your perception completely, which is unnerving. It's probably exactly how Leonard feels. Like Lenny, we rely on the jumbled pieces that we have to put in order as the film progresses. It's amazing how simple things get burnt into your memory that are wrong. Brilliant to tell the story backwards, because the guy can't remember shh. It's pretty much that simple. But not everyone was happy about this. There is an understanding between a filmmaker and an audience that depends upon at least knowing one thing your protagonist. I just felt manipulated. I think The Emperor's New Clothes applies here, with so many people impressed and probably intimidated by both the novelty and complexity of the structure that the story has received far more credit than it deserves. There really isn't much to it. Once you get past the fact that it's a revenge story being told backwards. I think it goes one step too far with the whole, was anything in this story true? It tried to be too clever. It's too complicated. In my eyes, a film should be comprehended on first viewing. Ultimately, the criticisms levelled at Memento are ones that Nolan would have been prepared for. He wants to frustrate the viewer, to offer alternate but equally valid explanations, and to make the viewer come back for more. The enduring popularity of Memento confirms Nolan's success in creating a puzzle for his audience. The fact that there is no solution to the puzzle, a fact which continues to frustrate and intrigue viewers in equal measure, truly instills Leonard's pathological state in the audience, long after the credits have rolled. I have to believe that when my eyes are closed, the world's still here. 
Do I believe the world's still there? Is it still out there? Yeah.